What I try to do in the book is find all of the ways that games help us tap into the best version of ourselves, the most curious, the most optimistic. People who tour these galleries often say, wow, I had no idea. Many think computing is about scientists, engineers, and mathematicians. But if you've ever texted, emailed, shopped online, or played a video game, you know computing is about you. Think of video games and consider this. The average player in America spends 10,000 hours on them by the age of 21. Dr. Jane McGonigal is a noted author and a game developer. She was here recently with NPR's Laura Seidel, and we asked her, are games merely an escape from reality, or can we harness their appeal for positive social change? So I guess if you thought games were just for fun, um, Jane basically has a thing or two to say to you. They are for fun, but they can also get us through a crisis, uh, solve the world's major problems, um, in fact, um, in your book, you do go back in time. And one of the stories I think that most intrigued me was the story about the, I guess it's the Lydians, mm -hmm. and how they used a game to get through a famine. Right, right. How many of you know that great tale of ancient Lydia and how they invented dice games? Any, any ancient Lydian fans here? I guess, um, I guess <laughs> not. So you're going to have to tell <laughs> us, I'll right? you then. Um, it's a good campfire story. Um, so actually the first written history of gamer addiction comes from ancient Greece. Uh, Herodotus was trying to document the origins of dice games that were popular at the time. And according to his research, the dice games had been invented in ancient Lydia, uh, many hundreds of years before him even. And they had been invented by uh, the king of Lydia and his team of problem solvers to help the kingdom overcome a famine. They had an ongoing famine. People were suffering. They needed some way to ease the suffering. So they invented these dice games, and they had the whole kingdom play dice games on one day. And then they would eat on the next, and then they would play the dice games and get so immersed in the dice games that they would not, they would forget to eat, essentially, and that they were able to space out the food for 18 years this way and survive the famine, um, which was very striking to me because uh, it shows, first of all, that games have always been able to immerse us in a way that we forget reality, with, even without the special effects and, and the 3D immersion, um, but also that we could play games as a society in order to deal with real problems. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, as you say, reality is broken, and, and games actually help people get through it. Um, and I, I believe it, the story turns out to probably be true. There's actually evidence yeah. that, that this truly happened. It isn't just some myth. There were genetic studies right. of people who, because eventually half the population left, right? Yeah, I mean, there was a, the great surprise ending of this story is that after 18 years, they decided to play one final dice game, and uh, they would divide the country into two teams, and the team that won would sail off in search of a new land, and then the rest of them would stay behind and they would have enough resources to feed them. For years, historians thought this was very fanciful and wasn't possibly true, um, but then two pieces of research have shown that it probably is true. Um, geologists have documented an 18-year cooling in the region that would have led to famine at exactly the time frame that Herodotus was pointing to, um, and also they were able to trace the DNA of Etruscans um, in, in what is now Italy um, to the Turkish region, which was ancient Lydia, and they believe that the Etruscans actually came from ancient Lydia, that they were the people who left after this dice game. So not only did they play the game to ease their suffering, but eventually they played a game for real stakes and a real way to solve the problem. Which is, which is amazing, and, yeah. and amazing just to think how much a part of culture games have always been. Right. And not an unimportant part. I mean, you know, we talk about fun and games, and most people kind of write off games as, well, a waste of time. 
Exactly. Um, and if we come to the present day, I, we began to hear some of the kind of amazing figures, but you have some figures in your book really about the amount of time, mm -hmm. the number of people and the amount of time people actually spend um, playing games. And it, you can recall some yeah, of these sure. figures. I was kind of like, oh my God, I can't sure. believe that. Yeah, so there are half a billion people now on the planet who spend at least an hour a day playing online games. And collectively, they spend three billion hours a week playing games, um, which is pretty staggering, just to put that number in perspective. Uh, about a year ago, Clay Shirky and researchers at IBM calculated how long it had taken to create all of Wikipedia, all of the articles, every edit, as well as every line of code. And they, um, they calculated it at 100 million hours. Uh, so at that rate, gamers could put together a couple dozen Wikipedias every week with the same collective effort that they're putting into, uh, you know, saving virtual worlds. Um, you know, on, on top of that, we know that young people in America have spent 10,000 hours playing games by the age of 21. Uh, the, the later you were born after 1980, the more likely this is to be true. But 10,000 hours is the same amount of time that they spend in the classroom for all of middle school and high school. So uh, it's really quite the sort of parallel education system that we have going on. Now, you would say, of course, why is this? Why are people playing so many games? And I, I of course, I, uh, this quote from your book, which um, struck me as a rather bleak view of reality. Reality is too easy. Reality is depressing. It's unproductive and hopeless. It's disconnected and trivial. It's hard to get into. It's pointless, unrewarding, lonely, and isolating. It's hard to swallow. It's unsustainable. It's unambitious. It's disorganized and divided. It's stuck in the present. So <laughs> that's, that's basically a summary of the book, yes. <laughs> so why not play games, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, to, you know, to, to be fair, reality is not always these things. Um, but what I, what I try to do in the book is find all of the ways that games help us tap into the best version of ourselves, the most curious, the most optimistic, the most resilient in the face of failure, the most likely to collaborate at extreme scales. And after we're done doing all those things in games, we go back to reality and it feels disorganized, it feels uncooperative, it feels unambitious. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean we can't be all those things in reality, it's just that we're not primed to look for those uh, opportunities or to feel those inspiring feelings in real life. We, we're trying to fix that, this is the idea. Uh, that, is, that is the idea. Well, you talk about in this how, how there are a lot of things that people do in games that in fact are showing the best parts of what it is to be human. Um, for example, cooperation. Right, yeah. No, we, uh, increasingly games are cooperative. I mean, that's a big trend in gaming that I think mainstream media has missed out on. Um, today, gamers prefer cooperative play to competitive play on an average of three to one. Um, cooperative games outsell competitive games three to one. And uh, so it's really different from what we've seen before. And, and this is something that's very particular to video games and computer games. You know, if you look at the history of gaming, uh, gaming, have, gaming has typically either been a solitary thing or competitive. Your team against another team, you against other players. Now we have these games where every player is on the same side. It's a very different emotional quality to the play. Um, it's a different skill set that you develop. And it turns out to be much more effective at creating really powerful social bonds. So that's something that video games get to claim um, all to themselves. Well, Farmville, right? You like help with your neighbors farm yes. and do things like that. Yeah. Not the most sophisticated example of, of cooperative gameplay. <laughs> no, but, but it is. You're right. No, you're but right. It, but it's fundamentally pro-social. You get to right. take care of things for your friends. Um, and we know a lot of people play those games because it feels more meaningful than just leaving them a message, you know, to actually help them get something they want. It feels like uh, you're taking care of each other. You say, you say something in the book, though, even about when you're talking about games like where people are shooting each other. Mm -hmm. um, just because the kills don't have value doesn't mean they don't have meaning. Right, yeah, and this is actually, this is a, this is a chapter in the book that um, people who don't play games have gotten the most upset at me for writing um, because I, I talk about the Halo series, which is an uh, incredibly popular series that has people been playing the series for a decade now, and there's a sprawling story, and there are, uh, you know, millions of players, and they band together to do interesting things inside the game, like they decided they wanted to collectively 
achieve six billion kills, or the equivalent of every man and woman and child on Earth. I should point out that they were killing aliens who were hell-bent on exterminating the human species, so, you know, it was... It was, it was an act a, of her, it was, it was heroism. It was a worthy right? yeah. mission. Um, but, you know, they banded together to do this. They worked together as a community. And uh, when you were playing the game by yourself or with your friends, you knew that every alien that you took out was adding, adding to that collective total. So you were part of a bigger mission. And what I find interesting is, you know, yes, that doesn't actually help the real world in any way, but it does start to tap into our desire to be of service to a larger cause. And so it doesn't mean that you know, it's pointless. We see these gamers are having, we're, they're tapping into something that is fundamentally a human craving, the desire to be a part of something bigger. And so I see that as an opportunity. If gamers are feeling that, um, you know, are there other, other things we could tap them into, like curing cancer or ending poverty? Yes, well, we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, we're gonna get we're gonna get to that. But I think there is some sense. I mean, who is playing games? And a lot of times, it's people who feel alienated. So, right. So it's tapping yeah. into something in us where we we want to connect with other people. Right. Absolutely. And we know that a lot of people who play online games um, identify as introverted or they have social anxiety. Um, people with Asperger's are using games to try and find new ways for stronger social connection. And the research is starting to come out that, that these games serve as a kind of gateway or springboard that you can start to associate um, within your brain positive rewards of gaming with social interaction. So for somebody who's not normally motivated by social engagement, they become motivated by social engagement um, even when they're not playing the games. So it's actually a way to help people become more social in real life, not just in the games. I mean, I found this part really interesting, the idea of just looking into, really carefully looking into the things that a game might bring out in you. And I, I believe you, at one point you said that people who learn how to share, kids who do cooperative games, are actually more cooperative in the real world. Right, yeah, there have been a number of studies um, all over the world actually, from Holland to Malaysia, Japan and the US, looking at um, if you get kids playing what they call pro-social games, which is where you have to help other characters, um, like Super, Super Mario Sunshine, you land on an island, it's been polluted, and there's the graffiti everywhere, and you clean up the island and make everybody happy. Um, people who play games like that spend three times uh, as much, make three times as much effort in real life helping uh, another student with you know, homework or helping a house, housemate with chores. Um, and, and so they're still trying to unpack why that is, but they believe it's this sort of cognitive model that you develop a radar where you're looking for opportunities to help because when you're in the game, you're like, where can I help? Who can I help? Where can I help? And that, that cognitive framework seems to uh, go into real life. Yeah, which is, I mean, I guess there's some sense to that. If this is in a game, there are rules, you're in this world, you're kind of learning the rules, so why not take those rules elsewhere? Yeah. And I guess if, if a game is Grand Theft Auto, which is what I think a lot of people think yeah. of, it, you, you, you know, that doesn't sound very good. But, yeah. but no, Well, I'm <laughs> right? glad you mentioned that because it's worth mentioning. Um, you know, when you talk about that, you immediately, I'm sure many of you thought, well, if the good carries over into real life, doesn't the negative? Mm -hmm. um, and it's worth pointing out that they have found a couple of real negative effects of games, and people research this for a lot, and they know that driving, aggressive driving games can make you drive more aggressively in real life. Violent games do not make you more violent in real life, but it can desensitize you to media expressions of violence or violence elsewhere. Now, but what's interesting about that is it turns out that can be a benefit to some people. So soldiers who play three to four hours of violent video games like Call of Duty or Halo um, have incredibly low rates of nightmares, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, um, suicide attempts. Uh, I've actually worked with the Army's mental health assessment team to try and figure out why this is. Um, and there's new research to suggest that by being desensitized to impressions of violence, they're able to not, uh, not internalize the violence that they're around and that they can uh, take the feelings of optimism and control in the game environment and use that to offset how out of control they feel um, in the field. So 
it turns out to be very helpful to desensitize some people to violence, but you wouldn't necessarily want your kids to be desensitized Well, that, that's home. the problem, yeah. I think. You yeah. know, th those sorts of games, I think, make people very nervous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're talking about games in a, in a different way in the book, and I, I think you do do a good job of laying out the potential that you see in so many of these games. Um, I, you were talking about bringing things in the real world, and among the games that you mentioned that I was most intrigued by was Chore Wars. Yeah, any chore war players in the house? This is I'm one. ready to join I up see, on I this one. I see one, good. Um, this is one for everyone of all ages, right. Um, it's, a, it's a game you play at your home. Um, you go onto a website and you create your party, which is whoever you live with, and then you and your other, your roommates, your family, uh, your household, you create a series of quests that correspond with real chores, like uh, taking out the trash or cleaning the toilet, um, and then for the most hated chores that nobody ever wants to do, they're worth the most experience points and they have the highest probability of finding virtual loot. Um, and uh, when you do the real chore in real life, you log in, you claim the XP and you see if you got any loot um, and you play this for a weekend or a week or a month and at the end of it, you can see who's gotten the most XP and the most loot and trade it in for different things like my husband and I might use it to decide what to cook for dinner or what DVD to watch. Um, and so I you, have, get, you get your favorite tonight because you did the nasty chores? I have choice. the most XP. I'll cash yeah. in, you know, 100 gold coins or whatever. Um, but what's really cool, I mean, it, the testimonials of this game are great because you, women are saying, my husband cleaned the toaster and I almost fell over, like, in shock. <laughs> my kids were racing to, like, make their beds first thing in the morning. Um, we had an incident where I had to hide the uh, toilet brush from my husband because he was threatening to overtake me. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's, that's, that's great. And so the good thing about this game, you know, it's silly, but it's amazing how it cuts out tension in the household. Instead of having to nag your kids or get into arguments about who's done what, people just do it on their own. So it's a very simple solution to use what motivates us about games um, to improve our daily lives. Well, that's the thing. I mean, so, so often certain things are so serious. And the thing about playing a game is you think, oh, it's fun and games, right? So it's, it's taking, I think part of the point you're trying to make in the book is that it's taking that sense of fun and trying to bring it to something like a chore. Um, and then uh, we move forward into more complex problems that you could take these skills to do. I mean, for example, um, one game you mention in the book is World Without Oil, mm -hmm. um, which was, um, I guess, a public television experiment. Um, and th this is an interesting game. And here is where you sort of use some of the basic components of, of a game to take on a major world problem. Mm -hmm. And actually, the creator of World Without Oil is here tonight, I believe. Ken Eklund, are you here? You should raise your hand right yes. over there. Everybody bombard him at the end of this talk yes. with he questions about amazing games that can change the world, because he's, he's made quite a few. Um, world Without Oil was an online collaborative simulation of a peak oil scenario. So what happens if global output of oil can no longer keep up with global demand? Um, so we created this fictional scenario where the United States was particularly hit hard. Um, you would sign up to play and tell us where you live and we would give you real-time updates on the scenario based on where you live. We have this little alternate reality dashboard and you could see how your economy was being affected, um, whether you were getting food delivered, you know, could the trucks bring the food, could the buses get the kids to school, and we would ask you to make real-life choices as if the scenario were true. So if you couldn't get gas in the scenario to fill up your car, how are you gonna get to work? To actually try to get to work in a different way. If the food wasn't being delivered from more than 10 miles away, could you make dinner with just locally available food? And then they would document this with blog posts and videos and photo essays. So we just under 2,000 people spend their six weeks living in this fictional crisis. And at the end of it, they'd created thousands of guidelines for how to survive if we actually we're in a peak oil scenario. Um, everything about, you know, what kind of sermon would you deliver at church on Sunday? If you were trying to take a hot girl out for a Saturday night date, how would you do that? Um, and, uh, and what was great, really fascinating, was a year later in the United States, after we first ran the game, we had a real gas crisis. Prices in reality hit our fictional prices in the game. Well, actually, I believe the, the game, we were talking earlier, the game actually starts with a sort of fake news thing. Gas prices just hit $4 a gallon. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then they did. It yeah, seemed yeah. crazy at the time. Yeah. At the time, that seemed like a lot. So, yeah. And yeah. so then we were able to hear from players about how they had, they still had the habits in place from the simulation, or that they had these strategies ready that they were able to share with their neighbors and their friends and family. Um, so we were able to see that it made a, made a real difference. There's actually a blog that Ken has created called World Without Oil Lives, where you can see some of the aftermath of the game. But the best thing about it is it's all online. You can still play it. So we, we've had many, many classrooms, community groups, families play. So you can actually see if you could survive six weeks of a peak oil scenario, um, it's it's uh, it's fun. It's hard, but it's worthwhile. Well, some of the solutions people came up with too were things like you know wearing a solar headband that would charge your iPod. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I, and there was there was even one that had to do with NASCAR. I think. You oh know, yeah, well, of course, could... NASCAR fans were very concerned about peak oil because it would be detrimental. So they were looking into alternative vehicle racing um, as as a potential hobby, and I, that was great. No, but, no, but see, you're laughing, and this is this is the but thing. it really it look, happened, and it really, yeah. and 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 it is a real crisis. And this is, I think, part of what's very engaging about what you're saying is that you're bringing people into a game. And actually, you have a great definition of a game, the way you phrase it in the book, which yeah. is games are unnecessary obstacles that we volunteer to tackle. Yeah, um, I mean, golf is the best example because, <laughs> right? Clearly, clearly Maybe I don't even need to explain. Audience, no, but you right? know, in golf, you have a goal, which is to get a little ball in a little hole. And if it weren't a game, the way you would approach this goal would be to pick up the ball and put it in the hole. Yeah. But because it's a game, you agree to stand really far away and use a stick. So that's what taps into our curiosity and our creativity and our optimism and our desire to get good at something that we're bad at. Um, and that's what we did with World Without Oil. We may, it's, we, I mean, obviously it's not an unnecessary obstacle to consume less oil, it's, it's real, but we were able to frame it in a way, six week survival challenge, could you do it? That we could make it feel like an unnecessary obstacle and tap into their curiosity, yeah. Yeah, which I, I mean, because so, I mean, you talk about these things and even, you know, I think being in the news business, writing, you're taking on something serious and there's a serious tone and I think, so often that sort of turns people off, actually, of dealing with real problems. Right, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the one thing we know about games, is if we can get you to undertake the challenge out, out of your own interest and self-motivation, that you will enter the state of positive stress or you stress, where you're more motivated, you're more resilient in the face of failure, you're more likely to ask others for help, and you become more likable to others because you're energized and optimistic, so they're actually more likely to help you when you ask for it. And so this is kind of optimal state of human being. And when you're in this optimal state, in games, you know, you, you all know you can stay at the game for hours and hours, even if you're just failing and failing and failing. Um, it turns out most gamers spend 80% of their time failing, um, which, is, which is really fascinating. If you were to compare that with real life, most of us don't have that stamina to keep going 80% of the time failing. Um, so I mean, we're trying to bring that positive stress and that stamina that we get from unnecessary obstacles to real life. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you call it fun failure. Yeah, failure's fun in games um, because, uh, because you learn from failure safely. And you know, if it's, I'd, I'd love to mention an example from the real world um, because a lot of times when I talk about fun failure in games, people say, well, this is absurd because in real life there are consequences to failure and it's only fun to fail in games because there's no consequences. Um, but what we're learning from game design is that maybe we could make fewer consequences for failure in the real world and have better results. So there's a school in New York City called Quest to Learn that the whole curriculum has been co-designed by game designers. Um, it doesn't mean that they're playing games all day. It means that the way tests are designed or the way that courses are structured is like a game. And one of the things that they've implemented is a test taking policy where if you don't like your grade, you can take the test again and you can decide when you are satisfied with your grade. Um, this is how we play games. I keep taking the quest or redoing the level until I'm happy with my performance. Um, it turns out that kids actually learn better this way. In fact, there's a lot of scientific research from the past couple years showing that we learn more by taking tests than we do by studying because the test makes us actually examine what we don't know and see what our performance really is. So not only you know, does it help us learn more, but it also takes the punishment out of school. I mean, we're so punishing a failure in schools. These poor 
kids, you know, you fail once and that's it for life. It's permanent. Why do we have to be so punishing of failure in schools? You know, we don't have to. That's a decision. That's a design decision. So we can look at games and see that maybe if we made real world more like them and less punishing of failure is one thing to look at, um, we can achieve better results and, and a better emotional state. I, you know, most games, though, are they're made commercially. And um, largely, it's about getting people as addicted to a game as you possibly can. And I guess I wonder how you could really um, translate that, or, or would you? Is there any way the commercial world would really even be interested in mm -hmm. taking some of that creative power and using it for these things? I mean, there still is that sense. I mean, I think uh, 2,000 people fully participated in World Without Oil. You know that you could really draw in the kind of huge numbers that you right. get with a game like World of Warcraft. Right. Um, so there are a couple of things. I mean, one is we are seeing the commercial game industry start to get interested in this space. Um, one of my favorite serious games from the past year was done at the University of Washington um, with scientists. But they also recruited some of Halo's game designers um, and, and engineers to work on the game. So they had some of the greatest game designers working with scientists to make a game that would help gamers cure cancer or work towards curing cancer by folding protein in a virtual environment. Turns out that gamers are really good at folding proteins in novel ways that could be used to, to create medicines for things like Alzheimer's and cancer. They're better than most scientists who have training in it, and they're better than supercomputers who um, have algorithms to fold proteins. In fact, they published a paper in Nature Journal um, this year listing 57,000 gamers as co-authors um, for this paper on curing cancer. Um, so, so there you see people from within the industry joining forces. Now 57,000, still not 13 million, right. but um, you know, we don't really need everybody who plays commercial video games to play these problem-solving games. Um, 57,000 people working on curing cancer who'd never done it before, that's a huge leap forward. Well, I know, um, actually, I think um, I did a story a while back about how epidemiologists also found that virtual worlds and games were a great place to really understand how people were going to respond if there was an epidemic. Right. Um, yeah, we just had at the Game Developers Conference last week that researcher presented some of her work. Yeah, um, yeah because she, uh, she was saying that uh, scientists have a hard time of predicting how people will act in reality in a crisis and that you can put them in a game world and get really surprised. So they had a pandemic in World of Warcraft um, that was killing your avatar virtually instantly um, and leaving lasting damage. And uh, they thought most people would be smart enough to stay away from the pandemic um, sites. But in fact, people were curious and going to see what was going on. And they realized that they didn't have this in any of their models. For The CDC doesn't have a model for curious gawkers who want to see what's going on. <laughs> but you can imagine, of course, that this would in fact happen. So they've now since changed the real models they use to study contagious diseases to include, uh, to include this social propensity to gawk at, the, gawk at the news. So, you know, people are probably curious at this point, too. How'd a girl like you get so interested in, in games? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, was a, I mean, I was a geek growing up. I'm part of computer history. I had a Commodore 64 when oh, I was right. 10 years old. Uh, yeah, best computer ever, right? Um, I, so I programmed my first game when I was 10 in basic language, um, uh, which is <laughs> awesome. I mean, can I use this opportunity to describe my awesome first game I ever made? Because nobody's ever here played it. Here they are. You've got to, yeah. They're, yeah. they're not leaving. They're still here. Only so. my mom and sister have played this game. So really marvel at how special it is that you now know how it works. Um, it was called You Be the Judge, and it was a text adventure in which you would hear testimony in a trial, and you would rule on objections from the lawyers, and then you would decide if they were guilty or not guilty. Um, but I was using ASCII art, and I couldn't figure out how to draw a person, but I could figure out how to draw a cat. So you were a cat, and you were the judge. <laughs> and I made this great animation of a gavel going up and down, and the colors blinking, and, uh, and that was my first game. <laughs> so. Pretty so, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so then, then I was not quite as much a geek in high school and college, um, and I got into theater. And I was actually in, in grad school for theater at UC Berkeley. I came out for my first semester looking for a job 
something fun to do. And there was a startup company in San Francisco called The Go Game, looking to run games in real life urban spaces um, using mobile phones. They would send you location specific social missions. And uh, I said, oh, you need a stage manager, clearly, because you've got people running around, they made props, sets, actors. Um, and I convinced them to hire me. Uh, and that was my first game design job. They're actually still going, really successful game company here in the Bay Area. Um, but they were one of the first companies, uh, in fact, the first company in the United States to try to do this alternate reality blurring of the lines of game world and real world. So I just kind of got lucky and, and wandered into their office and, and got, got going that way. I guess, I guess then how did you start to realize, you know, in this process, being in the game world, which the commercial game world, where they're not really thinking about, you know, saving the world, how did you start to realize that, oh, gee, you know, games could be something that could do something really positive in the world? Yeah, so there were two big aha moments. Um, the first was working on the Go game. You know, we were playing it in the Mission, in Chinatown, in North Beach, and you would find that people who played the game, it was just for a few hours, um, they felt differently about the neighborhood. So they were more likely to go back to the mission, even if they'd never been there before. They were more likely to talk to a stranger or to go into a new space. Um, and they would even report just feeling confident and curious as they walked down streets. Um, just, it sort of changed the way they felt about this environment permanently. So I thought, well, this is really interesting. Maybe we could have this effect in other areas. Um, but also that same semester, um, this was the fall of 2001, and I had been playing an online game earlier that year that was very much about collective intelligence and collaboration. We had a team of about 40,000 people playing together, all on the same team, doing collective intelligence. Um, the game ended in July, and then 9-11 happened, and the gamers came back to the gamer forum that day. And um, many of them wanted to figure out if we could use our collective intelligence skills first to investigate what had happened, because nobody understood it, right. um, to see if they could find lost loved ones, to see if they could help uh, with relief efforts somehow. And they felt so empowered in the game world, they thought they had real skills and abilities that they could use as a team, the same team. And I was really startled by this. They debated a lot back and forth. They felt guilty about it at first. They were like, wait, there's a difference between games and reality. We can't pretend this is a game. But some of them were like, why not? You know, we have skills and abilities. Um, so that triggered me also to start thinking about, um, are there ways to actually bridge gamers' experience of being successful in games and having real skills and, and their desire to do something in the real world. And, and you also had, uh, although this might have been more recent, you had, a, you had a concussion. Yeah. And you actually helped cure yourself using a game. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> you know, true. That's, I mean, that sounds kind of wild, right? You know, to sort of cure yourself using a game. But, but I, found the story, I found the story really interesting. Um, and also, you are used to designing games, and so your mind, I think, kind of went there, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, this summer of 2009, I had a, what was first a simple concussion, um, but it didn't heal quickly. It was a month later, and I still couldn't really read or write. Um, I was, had nausea and vertigo all the time. And I was actually in the middle of writing this book. I was about halfway through writing it. I was on sabbatical from the Institute for the Future, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't write. I was so panicked. Um, I thought my brain would never heal, and I was doomed. Um, and my doctor was uh, explaining to me that anxiety and depression are a symptom of a brain injury, but you have to stop yourself from feeling that way because it, it biochemically inhibits healing. So you have to find a way to feel happy and optimistic, um, which I had a very hard time doing at, at, with, mm -hmm. with all the, the reality of what was going on. Um, I was reality is, is tough. Yeah, yeah, reality is tough, and it's really you tough. You to get out of can't it, think. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I couldn't play video games because they were too stimulating. So my, my normal go-to for optimism uh, wasn't available to me. Um, the other thing is that it was socially isolating. I mean, you know how it is when you, when you get sick. People don't know how to act around you, they're nervous, they, they don't come see you as much as, as maybe they want to. Um, so I was isolated too. Uh, fortunately, I was in the middle of writing a book about how games provoke positive emotions and strengthen our social relationships. So I had this one little moment of clarity where I thought I should turn this into a game and that will somehow bring me out of this darkness. Um, and so I created this game where you go on a heroic journey um, based on your favorite hero's story. So uh, I liked Buffy the Vampire Slayer. 
So I became Jane the Concussion Slayer. Um, and the way the game works is you find roles for people in your life to adopt. So, um, you know, if you were Batman, you would have your Alfred and your Robin and the mayor. Um, I had a Watcher and I had a Willow and a Xander. Like, Xander is a comic relief character. So I asked a couple of my friends to be my comic relief, come over once a week and make me laugh. Um, and so anyway, it was this sort of hacked together game, but it, it ended the depression and social loneliness for me so that my brain did start to heal much, I mean, right away, 48 hours of playing the game, I started to feel that suffering um, lift, lift. And uh, now we're doing clinical trials for it at Ohio State University Medical Center. Um, and we're expanding it to uh, help people with everything from asthma, diabetes, losing weight, quitting smoking, uh, chemotherapy. Um, uh, and so the game will be available for free uh, later this year. I have to say, though, I, I wonder how many people come up to you and say, oh, come on. Oh, you yeah. Know? I mean, really, and, and, what they, and then they throw at you sort of the litany of the terrible things about games. Yep. You know, the awful games, the shoot 'em up and yep. all of that. I mean, how often do you get people who kind of do that, like, give me a break? Yeah, every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's why I start in the book with gamers 3,000 years ago, because I think it's really important to realize that we're at a very specific moment in the history of games. I mean, here we are at a museum about computer history. Games have not always been about guns and shooting. Games have not always had graphic violence. Um, I'd be the first person to admit, there are things in games today that I am uncomfortable with, and games that I don't like to play because I feel icky or just bad when I play them. But we need to look, we need to have a bigger point of view. You know, that humans have been playing games as a way to organize ourselves and motivate ourselves since we've been human. Um, and, uh, and moving forward, we need to take what's powerful about video games, the way they inspire cooperation, the way they network us globally, um, the way they can be played at epic scales. We don't have to keep everything about games. Uh, nothing would make me happier if 20 years from now, uh, you know, shooter games are like kind of archaic the way Pong is. You know, I, that would actually make me happy. Um, so what I try to tell people who say, come on, you know, this is crazy, is just Think more broadly about games. It's not just about the latest game that sold you know, a lot of copies. And of course, if you think about film, there are some films that are shoot 'em up films, and there are films that are profound and deep and make you reflect on life. Oh, so. yeah, and think about what all the early films were. They were train crashes, they were elephants getting electrocuted, they were naked ladies dancing. I mean, that's not indicative of where the film genre went. So, I mean, well, it might be. Maybe it is, maybe it is. <laughs> But it also went other places with, with, with a lot more uh, interesting social uh, you know, yeah. value. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take some questions. I'm going to go with this one. So why do you think, someone asks, play has such a bad reputation, and how can we get adults to take it more seriously? Yeah, yeah. So the, the biggest problem with play is that we, we've been told that it's the opposite of work. Um, and that's an idea that I try to undermine in my book. Um, the, the, one of the best insights I've ever had about play came from a, a, a psychologist named Brian Sutton Smith, um, who was studying play long before video games came out. Um, and he proposed that the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. Um, and that's something that was another aha moment for me, because when we play, um, especially games, we're energized, we're optimistic about our possibility for success. Um, it really is the opposite of depression. Um, so it's, I think it's time for a new comparison, not to compare play with work, because we know when we play games, we actually work very hard. I mean, games are challenging by design. It's harder to get a golf ball in a hole standing far away with a stick than just walking up to it. Um, so the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. Maybe if everybody leaves with that and you can just whip that out the next time somebody tells you, you know, not to play, it's not valuable, that, that would be a good start. Right. Here's a, somebody um, talking about a game that helped them. I think this is kind of interesting. Um, two years ago, I was vi viciously depressed and could not keep my attention on anything for even a minute. I sat in my living room playing solitaire and waiting to die. Obviously, that game was not helpful, but... Um, <laughs> ah. Then a friend got me started on World of Warcraft, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, it literally healed me. I'm a new person, more functional than ever. Can you comment on this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So we know that many people who play MMOs are self-treating for depression and anxiety. Um, it's something that's been tracked for a while now. Or people thought originally that there was a correlation between the games causing depression, um, uh, but it looks now more that it's self, it's like self-treatment. Um, and so that is something very common. Um, women tend to self-treat more often with casual games. There's research that just came out this year mm -hmm. showing that um, playing online games like Bejeweled um, can be very effective for moderate, uh, m mild depression or mild anxiety, um, as effective as drugs, in fact, um, for, for sort of mundane cases. Um, for MMOs, um, we, we tend to hear about people going through something tougher and using the games as a way to spark uh, that sense of purpose and progress and, and social connection. So, let's see, would you talk to games' effectiveness as a medium for narrative? Yeah, I mean, games are an amazing medium for narrative. It's, um, it's uh, you know, increasingly we know that games are packed with with actual text. I mean, there's a game Dragon Age that came out that had eight to nine novels worth of um, narrative written in it. It's um, amazing. It's, it's truly amazing. And we know that the kind of stories that people are telling, they often do have this heroic sense, which is we, we love hero stories. We love the heroic journey. It's something that's intrinsic to human nature. Um, but in games, you get to be a part of that journey, right? So it's, it's like hearing this great legend, but then you become the legend. Um, so we do see that these stories have a, they, they can really stay with you. Um, uh, and, and even one of my favorite video games, I oddly think about when I'm uh, working out for no reason. I mean, this is, here's the strangest thing you'll hear all day. Um, has anybody played the game Portal? Right. Uh, I think there's a theme song at the end of Portal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm still alive, <laughs> and uh, when I'm working out, I think about how I survived that game, and I'm going to survive this workout, and I sing, sing, the, thong, uh, sing the song in my head, uh -huh. and sometimes out loud, and, uh, <laughs> and, but it's because the narrative in that game was so compelling. Both social and competitive games create social networks, um, most commonly in the form of friends lists. How well do these networks transition out of the vir virtual and into helping in real issues. Yeah, um, so people are just starting to look at the impact of these, the genre of social games um, on real life social relationships. And there was a significant study published in the last couple months um, looking at, at whether social gameplay leads to any more significant social interaction. Do you talk to people more if you've played a game with them? Does it change how you feel about them? Um, and, and so far, the, it's very mixed results. They found that people do report feeling more connected with people that they play, um, and that there's a very modest uptick in, in interacting with them outside of the mm -hmm. game as well. Um, but nothing, nothing super dramatic yet. Um, but of course, social games today aren't it's really that social. Um, and so social game developers are now trying to figure out how can we make social games really f feel like you're actually being social or actually require you to be social. Here's, here's a good, good question. Um, who is supposed to pay for these games that change the world? Why is it that McDonald's is willing to spend millions on games to sell burgers, but the government does little or nothing? Um, I've been working on games like this for a number of years, and I have worked with a whole host of different people funding the games, from McDonald's and the International Olympics Committee to the World Bank Institute um, to ITVS, which is part of the Corporation mm -hmm. for Public Broadcasting. Um, and so far, the games have been funded either by nonprofits, organizations that have a mission and they want to use this um, as a way to accomplish the mission out of, out of their marketing um, or community engagement budgets. Um, and then you also see for-profit companies who see it as a way to do social good or be visibly identified as being a part of social good. Um, and, and you know, think about, you know, that's, that's a model that this could happen. But now we're seeing a lot of venture capital investment in these kinds of games that have revenue models. Um, right. And uh, in fact, I have a startup company now called Social Chocolate, where um, we are going to be making games that we think will actually be able to generate revenue, not requiring um, foundations to, to just give money uh, to the games. Um, 
So, so I think that landscape is changing very quickly. Um, if we can't figure out how to make money with these games, it's, they're not going to be made. If you're engaged in a game, does it have, is it going to have a stronger impact on you than watching a movie? So if you go see you know, An Inconvenient Truth and you learn about um, climate change, um, is the experience of playing some kind of game related to climate change going to have a stronger impact? I mean, is there any research on that? Yeah, people are measuring that with some of the games that have been made around social issues. Um, uh, and, uh, and definitely, there does seem to be, if you've had a long enough exposure to the game, so the equivalent amount of time that you would spend watching a movie, if you can play the game for two hours, um, there does seem to be a more measurable cognitive shift. Um, particularly uh, where we see people uh, saying that they've changed their mind about something as a result of playing the game um, versus as a result of watching more passive media. Um, the key, of course, is to, to make a game that is as engaging for as long a time as you know, we can sit in front of a screen and watch stories unfold, um, but if we have to actively engage them, uh, that's more challenging. Is the finite nature of games, the self-contained contained inherently uh, solvable structure, an important part of why people are willing to approach them optimistically, and can we leverage that for social good? We know that people will try really hard at non-digital games to get better and achieve extraordinary things that no one has been able to achieve before. I mean, sports is a good example of this. Um, and that's not a bounded universe. We don't know what we're capable of, but we keep trying and pushing to get better. Um, so that it helps to, to, to open that up. Um, but then also we can take problems that are not easily solvable within a finite structure and find ways to create solvable structures. So the, this game we were talking about at University of Washington, it's called Fold It. Um, and what they did was they found a way to make curing cancer have a solvable structure within it, um, which was that the gamers were challenged to get better at the supercomputers, that, then the supercomputers at 10 specific protein folding challenges. Um, and so, you know, it, the game wasn't go solve cancer and let us know when you're done. It was, <laughs> it was here are 10 specific challenges that would really help us understand a path to curing cancer. You collectively, amongst yourselves, we think you can do it, but we don't know. Good luck, here you go. And that actually was sufficient that the gamers were able to beat the computers on five out of 10 within six months. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, obviously games are designed to be won and real life problems aren't. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from games about designing structured challenges that do make it feel possible and, and to provoke the optimism. Games have rules, and so whatever, you're going to always create certain limits within yeah. a game environment, which is, I, I guess, sometimes why they're nicer to be in than reality, where sometimes, you know, you really don't know what an outcome's going to be, and it can be scary or depressing and all that. In a game, it's a controlled environment. I think this is a real distraction from what's happening. Just to give you guys one more example, you know, what game designers are doing is they're inventing challenges that provoke curiosity. That's the most important part, not the bounded world. So if I were to ask you guys to try and get out of here tonight um, without touching the floor, um, and you can't move any of the chairs or whatever, or, uh, you know, <laughs> see if you could good do luck. it. Yeah, good luck. Um, you know, you guys would do some pretty amazing things to make that happen if you were committed to figuring out if you could do it. And that's what we're, we're trying to design games like that, where we can give you a challenge. We don't know, I had no idea if you guys could get out that door without anybody touching the floor, but uh, it would be really, I'd be, I think it would be fun to try and see if that could happen. And you guys would come up with some really amazing things to try. So that's the kind of problem solving we're looking at. Not that you have to fix everything right away, but that will unlock creativity and get teamwork at a scale that we haven't tried before. So a few more questions here. Is the capacity for games to do good limitless? Or should there be, are there limits to how much exposure people's society should have to playing games? Yeah. Um, is it limitless? I mean, I'm probably not. We'll start there. I'm sure there are limits. I mean, I don't think we've hit the limits. I don't think we're near the limits. Um, you know, my dream that I say is, um, you know, right now we're spending three billion hours a week playing games. I'd like to see that up to 21 billion hours a week. <laughs> and um, the way you get that math is to have three billion people playing for an hour a day. 
So uh, I think it would be a great goal to get half the planet on the internet. That would be the first thing that you'd have to do, and that would be awesome just to get that done. And an hour a day, which uh, gamers today spend between 10 and 16 hours a week already. So this is actually a reduction in game time in a way. Um, but I think the key is to play just enough to provoke these positive emotions, to strengthen the relationships, and to prime us to solve really hard problems. Well, it's, it really does seem like it's very early days for computer and digital games. I mean, this, yeah. you know, it, we really have no idea how far this can go, just, and as technology is developing at the speed with which it's developing and things get faster, the internet gets faster. Uh, so, for the moment, it, it may be temporarily seem limitless. Yeah, but it's just it's something fun to imagine. I mean, we know what games look like with the number of people on the internet today. Um, we have 110 million people playing Cityville. That's the largest number of people who've ever played the same game at the same time. Um, and just imagine what that could be like if we had a billion people playing the same game at the same time. It's just, you start to, we, we don't know what that would be like. We have no idea what it would be like to have that many people playing the same game. I wanted to end by letting you do a little bit of a reading oh, yeah. from, from the book. Yeah, so here I'm going to ruin the surprise twist ending. I hope you guys have already read the book. Right, you're going to hear the end of the plot, so if you don't yeah. want to know... Shocker! Okay, so the book is called Reality is Broken, but the conclusion is called Reality is Better. Sorry to, uh, <laughs> to, to spoil that ending. Um, and it starts with um, this great oops, excerpt of a little poem um, that was called The Litany Against Fantasy Worlds, um, written by a futurist. And it reads, if I'm going to be happy anywhere, or achieve greatness anywhere, or learn true secrets anywhere, or save the world anywhere, or feel strongly anywhere, or help people anywhere, I may as well do it in reality. So that's, that's, that's sort of where the book ends up, um, thinking that uh, we can do all these things in reality. Um, and just to share a little bit more with you, we can no longer afford to view games as separate from our real lives and our real work. It is not only a waste of the potential of games to do real good, it is simply untrue. Games don't distract us from our real lives. They fill our real lives with positive emotions, positive activity, positive experiences, and positive strengths. Games aren't leading us to the downfall of human civilization. They're leading us to its reinvention. The great challenge for us today, and for the remainder of the century, is to integrate games more closely into our everyday lives and to embrace them as a platform for collaborating on our most important planetary efforts. If we commit to harnessing the power of games for real happiness and real change, then a better reality is more than possible. It is likely. And in that case, our future together will be quite extraordinary. Surprise ending. Sorry. The surprise ending. Well, <laughs> there's the book. Jane McGonigal, Reality is Broken. Um, and I guess I want to say, Jane, it's been fun. In the blink of an eye, we've gone from the simplicity of Pong to globally connected simulators. Explore the history of computing and you'll connect the past to the future. See you next time on the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.